Um, the suggestion was that we look at the subject of uh, termination of pregnancy and um, halakhic issues. So let's try to, to um, develop an approach to the subject from a Jewish point of view. Uh, perhaps it's better if you ask questions, try to cover the things that are of interest to you, see a few, a few um, number of doctors present. But first, let me try to uh, paint a picture of the issues or the major sort of approach to the subject, Jewish attitude to the subject, um, to set the, set the scene. First of all, just uh, by way of sort of spiritual background, I suppose, you know that the unnecessary termination of a pregnancy is um, spiritually a very negative thing. The Zohar says, in fact, the Zohar says that one of the categories of people who drive the divine presence from the world is uh, people who are engaged in um, destruction of a pregnancy. The Zohar actually gives a reason. It says that this is the sort of personal handiwork of Hashem in progress, the formation of a human being, and um, terminating a pregnancy or destroying a fetus is... Kabbalistically, extremely, extremely negative. Um, the perhaps uh, one of, for those who need it, a practical illustration of that is a um, case I actually heard of recently. Uh, heard it actually from someone connected to it, where a uh, <coughs> fellow was driving in a, down a road in, in Israel in the Gush, and he was shot by Arabs from one of the villages, and um, he was bleeding on the road. And what happened was another fellow drove past and under fire, stopped, got out and picked him up and uh, risked his own life, great risk to his own life. And actually uh, picked him up, took him to hospital and saved his life. The, the fellow succeeded. Yes, he survived. He, he, was, he was okay. And sometime later, his mother, who runs a general store, my college in Israel, his mother was running a store, a woman about her own age walked in and told her the following story. She said, you recognize me? The storekeeper said, no, she didn't recognize us. She said, I'm the woman who was in hospital with you when we were having ultrasound scans when we were both pregnant 30 years ago. And I told you then that I was going to terminate this pregnancy. I was pregnant at the time and I decided I want this baby. And you would not let me do it. You, um, you phoned me afterwards and you came to visit me and you eventually, you, you put such pressure on me, I had the child. I want you to know that the child that I had is now the young man who stopped to save your son's life. Okay, uh, a few weeks ago, and um, that was that. That's the, the result. That's your personal share in, or reward, if you like, for what you did in convincing me not to have a, ter- a pregnancy terminated. So there are many questions here, too many to cover tonight, really. All sorts of questions. Um, some bizarre, some some unusual, some common. The commonest question, of course, when it comes to abortion, terminating pregnancy, is really whether it's permissible. But there are sometimes questions about whether it's obligatory. Not, long, not too long ago, a woman um, actually came to see me. The situation was like this. She was in her, just entering a third month of pregnancy. She was uh, 42 years old at the time. She'd been married before and she had one child. And now in this second marriage, she had just for the first time become pregnant. And during the early stage of the pregnancy, she discovered a lump in the breast. It turned out to be malignant. And shortly before I got up, I'd engaged in, in speaking to her, she'd had a breast removed, and they had um, told her that in her situation she needed chemotherapy. And the problem was that they wanted to give her chemotherapy, they wanted to terminate the pregnancy and give her chemotherapy, and she insisted on continuing the pregnancy. She said she'd take the chemotherapy seven months' time after she delivers a child, she's not prepared to give up this pregnancy. Now, the, the, the battle there was between the medical opinion that said that they thought she ought to have the termination of pregnancy and chemotherapy, and she who insisted on carrying the pregnancy to term, refusing the chemotherapy. Here the problem wasn't whether the uh, termination was allowed, halakhically it certainly was. Here the problem was maybe she was obliged to have the termination of pregnancy. What would Judaism say about that? If her life's at stake and we could save her life at the cost of the fetus, as I'll try to show you, that might in fact be obligatory. <clears throat> this is a very difficult question. In fact, the medical side of this question also not, not simple. The reason being that there's very little information on chemotherapy in pregnancy. You know, we don't normally give chemotherapy to pregnant women. It's, it's uncommon for many reasons. And therefore, there are very few studies that have actually looked 
get the effects. In fact, consultants were unable to tell her what would be the effect of the chemotherapy on the pregnancy. Would it destroy the pregnancy? Would the child be born with abnormalities? What exactly would be the, the consequences? I managed to track down what information there was. I contacted experts in, in the States. And eventually what I was able to do was clarify in her particular situation what was her statistical chance of survival in either, on either side, either limb of the decision. And it turned out to be that <coughs> the assessment of her, her cancer at that particular stage was that if she, she probably had about an 80% five-year survival chance given the staging that she had at the time. And chemotherapy probably would increase the chances to about 85%. It was pro- as close as we could get the figures. And I went to Rabbi Yashif, I actually went to two great authorities, one of them Rabbi Yashif, and he said under those circumstances she's fully entitled to continue the pregnancy. Judas, Jewish law does not require her to terminate the pregnancy or have chemotherapy, and in fact that is what she did. That's what she did. Of course you realize that the difference between 80% survival and 85% makes that question relatively relatively straightforward. If she would have had a greater than 50% survival with chemotherapy and less than 50% survival without it, could it be a very different question. But he felt that for that kind of slim, slim difference in statistical survival, given, as any good doctor knows, the massive difference in, in, in will or psychological status, that means a woman who's insistent on, you know, on, on fighting this and carrying the pregnancy to term, if you force her into an abortion and force her to chemotherapy, there's no telling how much difference that itself will make to her status. You could more than offset <coughs> the difference in the, you know, the, the, the technical or chemical benefit. You could more than offset by the, the emotional, psychological thing, and that was the decision in her case. So you have all these types of questions. Is a, a, a termination a, a permissible in, the, in these situations? Is it obligatory in others? And there are all sorts of permutations. Is there a difference between Jew, Jews and non-Jews? What happens when the girl is very young? What happens in a situation of rape? What happens in a situation of incest, where the child will be born with certain halakhic problems, where the parents might very much benefit from, from them terminating this pregnancy? All sorts of permutations that are asked in all sorts of situations and all different stages of pregnancy, very many um, um, shades and nuances of this question. Let me try to... Let me try to... Uh, I don't know if you're aware that termina- termination of pregnancy is very widespread. And if you know, abortion is a... You know, there are tens and tens of thousands. In Israel alone, 40 or 50,000 um, pregnancies are terminated yearly, somewhere around those figures. I mean, in the States, of course, you talk about much higher numbers. Talking about in, in, in lib- so, so-called liberal Western countries where the law since, I think it was uh, in about 30 years ago, 1973, I think it was, that the Roe versus Wade decision took place in America where pr- uh, termination laws became liberalized. Since then, there are vast numbers of terminations of pregnancy. Actually, the Kabbalistic sources say that many pregnancies are naturally lost. And the reason for that is actually there are sources that say that just before the Messianic age, Lots of pregnancies will be lost, more than, yeah, there'll be acceleration of that. And the reason is that many souls have to come into bodies, the Kabbalistic idea. And before Mashiach, before the Messianic, um, sort of, uh, Messianic period, all souls that need to come down will be brought down. There'll be an acceleration of that process, and it could even be that the souls might just need to come into bodies long enough to be <coughs> embodied, even in a pregnancy, even if they don't survive to be, to be, to be born. And therefore, there, is, there are sources that say there will be an acceleration in the natural phenomenon of pregnancies that are being lost. It sometimes comes, comforts women who lose a pregnancy through no desire of their own to know, that, to know that the soul coming into a body, Kabbalistically, has an ongoing connection with that body. Right? I don't know if you're aware of that. There's an ongoing connection of the soul with the body, no matter, <coughs> I wouldn't say no matter how early the pregnancy, certainly after 40 days, according to... Talmudic and Kabbalistic sources, after the child is already formed and its parts are recognizable, certainly then there is an ongoing connection between that soul and that body, which means in the face of the resurrection, that child will be, um, will be present. And that's why we have the custom of, for example, burying bury a child, even though there may be no mourning period, but we, ne- we definitely bury a child like that. And in fact, we also have a custom, if it's possible, to perform a bris, circumcision on the child, um, even though the child did not survive to be born. In fact, um, I personally had that experience when I moved from Israel to South Africa. We, my wife and I we lost a pregnancy with a five-month-old, particularly beautiful little baby boy. And um, I actually did a, a bris on the, on the child before burying the child. The reason we do that custom is because, um, because there's a concept that this is an ongoing existence, even though a child didn't live to be to be born at term or live into the age of having free will. Nevertheless, that is an, a, a, a full-fledged human entity. So, 
So, what are the factors that govern termination of pregnancy? What makes it permissible? What are the parameters? Um, first of all, let's be quite clear that the default position is that it's not allowed, okay? Uh, no matter what the American courts may say, and um, it's a woman's right and her own body and so forth, Judaism says that quite clearly that uh, terminating a pregnancy for no reason is not allowed. How serious is the prohibition? What exactly is the nature of the prohibition? What is the punishment? There's a very wide-ranging debate. <clears throat> Let me try to give you a bit of an organized background so we see where, where we're coming from. Um, the verse that's relevant here, the verse that's relevant is a verse in the parsha of Noach, in Noah. Then the verse says as follows. It says, Shefech dom ha'adom, ba'adom dom ha'ishafech. Very interesting verse. It says that somebody who spills human blood, by humans his blood shall be spilled. Right? Which is a clear Torah source for capital punishment. That means that if somebody commits murder, then under, certain, under the right circumstances, technically speaking, a person needs to be warned by witnesses, register what he's doing is wrong, you need all sorts of, uh, all sorts of legal parameters to be in place. But given those, those variables, then there would be Torah posits capital punishment for homicide. Now, we have here a fascinating way of looking at this verse. I don't want to go too much in detail off the subject of abortion, but we have an axiom in Torah that whenever you can read a, a verse in more than one way, both of those ways are valid. For example, you know that the Torah text has no punctuation. Right? You know that. In fact, Kabbalistically, there's no space between the words even. So even words could even be run on in, in certain circumstances. But certainly punctuation we don't have. Now, if you can punctuate a verse in more than one way, and it will come out that each way you punctuate it comes out with more than one meaning, right? The each, each, each system, each application of a punctuation system will give you a different meaning. <coughs> we have an axiom that all those meanings are intended. This is one of the ways you can code more information. You can compress more information into a, a finite uh, text. One of the techniques is that you can legitimately, if you can legitimately, according to the rules of Hebrew grammar and syntax, if you can express a verse in more than one way, then all those ways are valid. Now, in this particular verse, there are two obvious ways to punctuate the sentence, and the Talmud, in fact, does this. The first way is like this. Shefech doma adon, someone who spills the blood of a person, ba adon doma yishafech, by a person, or by humans, his blood shall be spilled, which clearly means that if somebody kills somebody else, then it's in the human realm, not in the divine realm. Some Torah punishments are in the realm of divine retribution, some are in human court. This clearly means that a human court has to take matters into their own hands and apply, under correct, correct circumstances, apply that sense. But there's another way to punctuate the verse, and it's like this. Shefech dom ha'adom ba'adom, dom ha'ishafech. Which means, sounds peculiar, but it means this. For someone who spills the blood of a person inside a person, he shall be killed. So the Talmud says, who is a person inside a person? Well, it's a fetus. And therefore, in the very same verse in the Torah, where the consequence of homicide is stated to be capital punishment, the very same verse posits the same punishment for feticide. So therefore, there's a clear verse in the Torah that says that the prohibition of killing a fetus is explicit in the Torah, and it is clearly in the category of uh, homicide, and therefore there's capital punishment, and also, you see from this, not only that, you see that a fetus is regarded as a person, because the word that's used here is Adam. Adam means, in English they translate it as a man, but it doesn't mean a man, it means a human. And therefore you see that that word is applied here, and so, that's the source of the prohibition. <coughs> now, the problem is like this. That verse, which seems to be very clear, applies to humans, not to Jews. Right? Now, Jews, of course, are human too, I mean, most of us, and, um, <laughs> and therefore... Uh, it would seem to apply to us as well. But the issue here is more complex, and it's like this. We have an axiom that whatever the Torah says for mankind applies to mankind. But our law as Jews is, um, is at Sinai, the Jewish law supersedes human law, right? Which means that you have to know as a Jew, you have to be able to find the prohibition in the Sinai covenant, in the Sinai text. In other words, where at Sinai was a particular issue allowed to us or forbidden to us, that would be the binding source for us. Again, are we together? We are bound by mankind's laws, true, and they're debatable under what circumstances, what punishments, do we have the same punishments as non-Jews, to what level of tolerance. That, that's a fascinating issue. But, this actually goes back to the discussion, you know that there are 613 commandments. The source, many sources say there are actually 620 commandments. According to one opinion, 613, and seven rabbinic commandments. According to another, and these are not exclusive necessarily, there are 613 commandments and seven Noahide commandments. The Noahide commandments are those commandments that the Torah binds non-Jewish society in general. 
And they're very interesting. These commands, not going to go through them now. But they have a completely different approach than, than Jewish mitzvahs. For example, the tolerances are much smaller. You only need one witness in non-Jewish law. You only need one judge. Um, they're all capital crimes. Completely different uh, concept of law than, than, than we have. The question is, are we obliged by the same laws because we're human just like non-Jews? And then we have separate laws as well. Or are our seven laws, yeah, our seven laws that are those laws, set anew in Torah later as well? Now, this is an issue. But, whichever way you look at it, you need to demonstrate that a thing is prohibited to us, not because it was prohibited to mankind only, but because it was said at Sinai. Okay? And the question is, what was said at Sinai in terms of abortion for Jews? Don't make a mistake, we're not allowed. Okay? Jews are not allowed to commit abortion, no question about that. But, what exactly is the textual source for us? Okay? So the question is actually a fascinating question, there are many opinions, but there are three major opinions. So let me run through these and show you the consequences. The three opinions for us are, first of all, that we are bound in the same way as non-Jews, which means that the prohibition of abortion for us is also in the, in the category of homicide, with all its consequences. Um, the difference, of course, is that all Jewish sources agree that for a Jew it's not a capital crime. It's forbidden, but it's not a capital crime. Which means it's not a capital crime in the hands of a human court. Okay? There's debate about exactly what the punishment is. There's one extreme opinion that there's no punishment stated at all, although it's completely forbidden. There's a widespread opinion that it's death at the hands of heaven. Okay, that means very serious consequence, but not actionable in a human court. This is also challenging. Why not? Why, why does a human court not action a punishment for, for feticide? What is it about a fetus that doesn't deserve a death sentence when somebody kills a child? Again, this is an interesting debate. One opinion is because there's no guarantee that the child would have lived. Not because it's not a person. It could be a full-fledged person. But since there's no guarantee, although most pregnancies survive and the child is born and survives, there's no guarantee that a pregnancy would have survived to term. You can't kill a person unless it's certain that he killed somebody who was alive. Okay? And majorities is not enough. We can't kill people. We don't apply capital law, capital punishment, on the basis of majorities. Since a majority of pregnancies will survive, that's fine. But that's not good enough to put someone to death. That's one opinion. So, interesting debate about why the punishment is not, is not human punishment actionable, even if you rule, even if you rule that killing a child, killing a fetus, is considered taking life. So that's one opinion, and in fact the definitive position in Jewish law, the bottom line, according to many of our authorities like Ramosha Feinstein, is this is the line that we take. In other words, when considering why abortion is forbidden for Jews, there's a very weighty opinion that is also in the category of homicide, which makes an extremely weighty prohibition, and we do anything to avoid it if possible. That is one line of thinking. But there are at least two other lines of thinking. One is that the prohibition of killing the fetus is not in the category of capital punishment, because the Torah doesn't say so for Jews, but it is an injury, constitutes an injury to the mother. Okay? An injury to the, one opinion, an injury to the fetus, that's another interesting thing. See, in Jewish law, a fetus has has rights. In Jewish law, fetus has inheritance law. Fetus inherits, at least from a certain point of pregnancy onwards, interesting debate, how that works. But a fetus has independence in that sense, that not only does he have rights of inheritance, but his parents also have rights to have him born. For example, in Jewish law, a father has a say in preventing his wife from having a termination, okay, because he has interest in the child that the Torah gives him. It isn't only her child, it's his too. And therefore he has certain say about his right to the child, to the child's being born, in as much as it grants him certain rights in terms of an heir. The father has a say there. So, so that's the second opinion, is that what you're really doing here is an injury. The majority, the preponderance of opinion here is that if you rule that it's an injury, it's an injury to the mother. Now, we, let, let's just stop for one moment. When we explore the derivation of a law in Judaism, we always presuppose that yeah, they always presuppose a certain line of thinking. Let me try and make this plain. Again, what are we discussing? Where is the source of the law prohibiting Jews from committing abortion? In Talmudic learning, we always stop when we have a question like that. Those of you who have learned Talmud will know, and those of us who study together will also establish this. Whenever we have a question like this, we always stop and say, what difference does it make to know what the source is? Again, if all agree that Jews are not allowed to commit abortions, who cares what the source is? Let me put it another way. If we all agree that the outcome is it's not allowed, then the debate about the source is what you call in English academic. Uh, are, you, are you with me? If I can tell you that all Jewish authorities agree that you may not commit an abortion, but there's an interesting debate about which verse in the Torah is the source, anyone learned in Talmud will automatically say, who cares? We do not have academic discussions in Torah. Is that, is that clear? We never explore an academic avenue like... It doesn't really make any difference to the outcome, but academically it's interesting to know what the source is. That's never the approach in Jewish thinking. Okay? The approach is always, if we debate what the source is, it must be because, depending on what source we decide to rule is the operative one, will make a difference in output. 
Is this clear? I don't see enough happy faces. If I say to you, yeah, if you say to me, how can I get to town? And I say, you take a 13 bus, or you can take a mini cab, or you can take a tube. If you're a Talmudist, you will say to me, why are you wasting my time with three answers? That's academic. Just give me the w- one of them, and I'll take that one. And I'll have to justify myself if I'm a Talmudic thinker. I'll have to say to you, one's cheaper, one's more pleasant, one's got more view. You know, you can see very pleasant view if you take the underground. Because <laughs> it's inhabited by colorful denizens of the dark. And... Um, you know, so that's the advantage. So if, I, if I, I have to justify why I'm giving you more than one option, is this clear? So in Talmudic learning, we never look to derivations that are differentiated unless there's a difference. Well, here you can see it readily. If, the dif- if we rule that abortion is forbidden for Jews because it's homicide, the consequences are very, very clear. Right? For example, it's a capital crime. Even we can't put you to death for it, but it's in a very serious category, and the punishment could well be death at the hands of heaven. If we say it's an injury to the mother, it's a much lesser crime. Again, I didn't say it's allowed. It's a Torah prohibition, okay? There's a Torah prohibition of injuring someone. But it's certainly not a capital crime. What's the punishment for causing an injury? Jewish law? What's the Torah punishment for injuring someone? Well, no, no. The answer is, you have to pay five heads of damage if you injure somebody, okay? Five categories of damage. You have to pay their lifetime depreciation in earning value. That means the economic value. There's no value of a person's... You can't value a limb or an organ yeah, in absolute terms. But you can value it in terms of their earning capacity over a lifetime. So you'd have to value, you'd have to pay them the difference between what they could have, what they were worth economically, measuring a person as an e- economic entity. You have to pay for their unemployment during the healing. Okay, the difference between what they could have earned and what they can earn sick. For example, if they can do some uh, light job while they're ill, you have to pay the difference between that salary and what they could have earned during the time of their unemployment. Thirdly, you have to pay all medical bills. That's called repui. You have to pay it in advance, by the way, on assessment, not afterwards when they hand you the bills. Okay, they get an expert assessment of what the costs are likely to be, and you pay that up front. And if it's much more than the bill's cost, then you don't get any back. Okay, that's the third head of damage. Fourth, you have to pay their pain. That means the value of the pain they suffered. And fifth, you have to pay the value of their humiliation. Well, I know what you, what's bothering you. How do you value the pain? The answer is very simple. That's quite easy. The Gemara says you do a market survey of how much people would take to undergo that sort of pain. Right? Well, you know, um, that's quite an easy thing to do. How much would you take to have the pain of a broken arm? 100 pounds? 1,000? 10,000? Well, I, there's a figure. Believe me, there's a figure. There's a figure. Actually, the Thomas conclusion is we don't value the pain. We value what people would pay for an anesthetic to get out of that pain. The case the Talmud gives is a person who's sentenced to have, his arm, to have his arm cut off by some non-Jewish authority. There are people who believe that for things like stealing, the hand gets cut off. So this person is, de- is, de- is um, sentenced to have his arm cut off, right, by some monarch, and it's going to be done with no anesthetic. He's simply going to take his arm and cut it off. But the executioner, the person who's going to cut his arm off, offers him an anesthetic that he won't feel it for a price. Okay, how much would you pay? Yeah, you're going to go through this anyway. The only difference is you'll feel it or you won't feel it. How much would you pay for the anesthetic? Well, you can do a market survey. How much would you pay for the anesthetic to prevent the pain of a broken arm? 100 pounds? Maybe 1,000? Maybe not. 10,000? I'll suffer the pain. <laughs> there's a clear market price, right? So you can value, you can do, you can value the, the price of it. Then there's humiliation. The person may be shamed by a certain kind of injury. Or, in fact, the Talmud says, even if there's shame without injury, you have to pay for that as well, if you, if you humiliate someone. And that goes according to the circumstances. Who's doing the shaming? Who's doing the, who's being shamed? That depends who's doing the shaming you. Somebody of a higher station, more social, more socially, you know, elevated on the social ladder. The Hasidim say that if the Rebbe hits you, then you make a kiddish. Right? Because that's a big honor, see? It's, it's a, that's a big honor. So you have to know who is doing the shaming. But if it's... You have to, so there are five categories you pay for injury, but it's not a capital crime. So it makes an enormous difference if you rule that the punishment, that there's a capital crime, or you rule that it's an injury to the mother. There's a third opinion also in Jewish law, and that's a widespread opinion, and many authorities hold this, that, in fact, it's neither of those... But committing an abortion, in fact, transgresses the prohibition of wasting male seed. There's a Torah prohibition of wasting male seed. Interesting prohibition. A very interesting discussion about this. Does it apply? <coughs> There's an interesting debate about whether this applies to non-Jews also. You see, the problem of wasting seed has got two issues. One is there's the issue of wasting the seed, which the Torah prohibits. The other is frustrating the opportunity to bring children into the world. And non-Jews also have the obligation to bring children into the world. So in performing an abortion, there's also that issue, right? Which is the prevention of what could have been a birth. Now, this also applies to contraception in a certain way, and that's not our subject tonight. But 
That, that is the third opinion. Now, if you rule that the problem of destroying a pregnancy is in a sense destroying male seed, although it may not be in the form of seed, it's in the form of seed that is developed to the point of a pregnancy, nevertheless, it's considered destruction of male seed, then you are talking about something that, first of all, may have punishment by death at the hands of heaven, maybe a very serious thing, but it's certainly not a capital crime in human terms. Um, and there are many other differences. Let me share with you one fascinating one, and it's this. If you hold that the prohibition of abortion is based on the Torah's prohibition of, of wasting male seed, then many authorities hold that women would not be prohibited. You get that? Women would not be prohibited. Because women, according to many opinions, are not prohibited, although some say they are, but many say women are not prohibited from wasting male seed. It's not their problem. For many, yeah, various approaches to this. One approach is that there's a general Torah concept that you're only prohibited in something that's in your category of... Pre- yeah, of yeah. And since a woman doesn't have the category of male seed, it's not hers, therefore destroying male seed, she may not be prohibited. Now, of course, if you rule this way, you have a very fascinating application. It could be, if you rule this way, that a woman may be permitted to perform an abortion. Because if the prohibition is the wasting of male seed and only men are prohibited, it could be that a woman, a woman is not prohibited. You, do you see this? Mm-hmm. And in fact, there are authorities, like the Tzitz Eliezer, for example, there are Jewish authorities who say that when an abortion needs to be done, we try to find a lady doctor. Not that we rule this way necessarily, but since it's one of the angles and one of the opinions, right, or it may be an issue super added to the others, then, if we can, we will look for a, in fact, if you want to be really specific, we look for a Jewish lady doctor. Why? Because it's our married plan already. Abortion is a much more serious crime for non-Jews. Right? Because they are definitely in the category of a homicidal prohibition when it comes to abortion. So we will, in fact, when a Jew needs an abortion, and a non-Jew will perform the abortion, if it's problematic for the Jew, it's not clearly indicated, it's very serious prohibition for the non-Jew, and serious for the Jewish woman, because she's um, obstructing, she's tripping, she's what called lifta ever. She's putting in front of this non-Jewish doctor a tremendous prohibition. She's engaging him in a prohibition that he's not allowed to do. So, so ideally, we would look for a Jewish woman doctor, okay, of course, we're assuming here that the, the abortion would be permitted in the first place, but when it's borderline or when there's discussion or argument, that would preferably be the line we'll take. And there are many other outputs to this. One famous one, just to close the circle, one famous one is, you know that the, 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 the classic permissibility for abortion is to save the life of the mother. Okay? The question is, is a non-Jewish woman allowed to use that <coughs> permission? Because if she's in the category of homicide, who says she can save her life by taking the life of the child? Who says she can do that? After all, who's, who's to say her blood is redder than the child's or sweeter than the child's? There are many opinions in Halakha that although a Jewish woman can save her life at the cost of a fetus's life, a non-Jewish woman can't do that. Because we're talking about a non-Jewish fetus that has the status of a full-fledged life here. Okay? As it happens, we don't rule that way. Well, the, the fascinating discussion about this, the bottom line ruling that we follow is for Jews and non-Jews that the threat to the life of the mother does justify, does justify an abortion. But it's a much more strict and serious thing for non-Jews. Incidentally, for Jews, sterilization is much more serious. Okay, and without going into derivations now, <coughs> just to emphasize the point that <coughs> Torah law for Jews and non-Jews is not necessarily the same. There are many differences. We have different spiritual realities, different spiritual <coughs> makeup, and different, just like men and women, are different spiritually. Obviously, we're not talking about <coughs> better or superior or inferior. We're talking about different spiritual parameters, and one of the outcomes of that is that Jews have a different set of prohibitions, different sources, their non-Jews do, this is one of the outputs. So, in summary, there are three opinions for Jews about what the prohibition is, although everyone agrees that it's prohibited. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, who's more or less definitive in this area, says you should assume that <coughs> we're in the most serious category. <coughs> in other words, whenever we're considering an abortion, we will always try to satisfy the most serious criteria, rather than go immediately to the more lenient and say, well, we can permit it on that basis. Okay? Because there's very weighty opinions that, in fact, we may be dealing with the most serious. So that is a summary of the approach to the source for the prohibition, and basically why it's very clear for non-Jews why it's prohibited, and for Jews, um, (coughs) these are the opinions. Now, if Taking that in, 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 into consideration, what would permit an abortion? What might even make it essential? Well, there's a Mishnah in the tractate known as Oilos. The Mishnah says that if a woman is in, 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 in labor, or a woman's pregnant, let's make it more general for the meantime, if a woman's pregnant and her life is threatened by the pregnancy, the Mishnah says you can, if necessary, dismember the fetus, okay, take it apart, embryotomy, you can take apart the, cut the baby apart in the womb, and extract the child limb by limb, okay? 
This is very significant that the wording sounds a little bit gruesome. The question is, why did it have to put it that way? Why didn't it simply say it's permitted to terminate the pregnancy? Why did it have to be so specific and, and choose a surgical means? It means there are many outputs from this Mishnah. We won't have time to discuss all of them. But just to, just to wet your, I don't know if you can call it appetite in a field like this, but just to, um, to have stimulate your interest in researching it further, um, the, one of the issues about taking, uh, extracting the fetus limb by limb, one of the outputs of that is that there's an overtone in this Mishnah that suggests that if you could dismember, that means if you could damage the child but not kill it, you'd be obliged to do that. If you could only save the mother's life, not by killing the child, that means if you could get away without killing the child, but you'd have to harm the child in some way, then there's a general principle in Jewish law that you can't kill someone who's threatening someone else if you can get away with only harming them. Is this clear? If someone's trying to kill someone else, that's called a redev, if you can shoot them in the leg and you kill them, you're in big trouble. You're only allowed to kill them if you couldn't have stopped them in any other way. So that's one of the applications. There's also another application for this Mishnah which is very important, <coughs> and that is when we're talking about surgical termination of pregnancy, that's a very different concept, halachically, than medical termination of pregnancy. Because when you give a woman a drug, that terminates a pregnancy, that halachically is called grama. Grama means you're an indirect cause. When you terminate the pregnancy surgically, you're the direct cause. And this has major differences in halacha, right? <laughs> For example, one of the classic ones is when a doctor makes a mistake. I know none of you, none of you would ever, of course, do that, and I give you my personal bracha that you should never <coughs> make a mistake. But if you do make a mistake medically, then um, the question is, if you do, the question is, how liable are you? Well, there's a big difference between a surgical misadventure and a medical problem. Because if you commit a surgical mistake, right, if you, if you amputate the wrong leg, then you're the direct cause, you're the proximate cause of that injury. Your liability would be much clearer and much greater than if you cause damage to a patient, for example, by writing a wrong prescription. If you wrote the wrong prescription, prescribed the wrong medication, <coughs> then the patient would be damaged by means of what's called a groma. You're an indirect cause. And there, it's much less clear exactly what your human liability would be. Okay? The, the, the decision we follow is that you're fully liable in the spiritual world, but it may not be actionable in human court. Okay? Now, if you, if you procure an abortion medically, then you are one step removed than if you do it surgically. This mission is saying that even a surgical termination, that means where you actually physically yourself are destroying the fetus, even that's allowed in the context of saving the mother's life. Okay? Actually, yeah, that, that's, there's also one while we're on the subject. There's another indirect um, uh, situation, scenario, and that is, what if the pregnancy threatens the mother's life indirectly itself? For example, there are two kinds of obstetric threat to a mother's life. One is where the pregnancy threatens her life. But a very common scenario in medicine is where the pregnancy exacerbates another condition that threatens her life. This woman is a brittle diabetic, or she's got um, a fragile heart disease, or she's got kidney disease, and the pregnancy tips her over into imbalance, and she's now going to die during the pregnancy, not because the fetus threatens her, but because the physiological load of the pregnancy has cast her pre pre-existing condition into imbalance. There, the halakhic authorities are much more hesitant to allow abortion. Why? Because the child is not the direct threat to her. Her direct threat to her life is an, a, unfortunately a condition that she has anyway. The child's not a direct threat. Okay? It's much more, we'll be much more careful and much more cautious. The bottom line ruling we follow, for those with a you know, primary practical output, the bottom line ruling we follow is that we allow abortion as well. We allow termination of pregnancy for a woman <laughs> who's got a cardiac problem or some other problem where the pregnancy exacerbates it, <clears throat> even if the child is not the direct cause. Okay? But we would be more cautious, we would try to find better reason, we would yeah, we would be more, more hesitant there because she, the child's not the direct cause. Now, now this Mishnah says that if a woman's in, uh, pregnant and the child threatens her life, then we could take the life of the child. The Rambam says that the reason is, now listen carefully, it gets very, gets complex and amazing here, without all the details. The Rambam says the reason we take the life of the child is because the child's considered a redev, an aggressor on the life of the mother. The concept of rape, the Gemara says, is that if someone's trying to kill someone else, actually, strictly speaking, also rape. We have the same law in terms of attempt, <coughs> attempted rape. But let's stick to murder now. If somebody's trying to kill somebody else, and you can only save the life of the victim by taking the life of the aggressor, you may take the life of the assailant in order to save the life of the victim. In fact, you're obliged to. All else being equal, all else being equal, okay, you're allowed to kill somebody who's trying to kill someone else if... All else being equal, that means it's not a policeman in the line of duty or, you know, somebody, um, somebody legitimate like one of your teenage children. You know, I'm mean, talking about where there's no, you know, no, no um, obvious compulsion here. And all else being equal, somebody's trying to kill somebody else. There you can kill the aggressor to save the life of the victim if there's no other option. That's called redev. Now, 
of the classic case of Rodef, of course, is self-defense. Right? Self-defense. When someone tries to kill you, you can preemptively kill them. It's very important in the law of abortion, because the mother here is the one whose life is being threatened by her own fetus, and that makes a difference. I'll try and explain where. So, the Rambam says <coughs> that the fetus here is an aggressor on the life of the mother. That's a very peculiar thing that he says, because the fetus has no intention to kill. The fetus is completely non-sentient. It's not, it's not trying to kill the mother at all, and yet he rules that it fits into the parameter of what's called a red. The reason this is so important is because the code of Jewish law quotes him verbatim. The code of Jewish law, the Shulchan Aruch, which is definitive for us, quotes the Rambam and rules that into effect, and therefore it binds us completely, yeah, clearly. So we rule that a fetus threatening the life of the mother is a redef, and the rationale we use to take the life of the child is because when it threatens the life of the mother, the mother's life comes first. Now, the obvious question here is, why is the mother not a redef on the fetus? Why isn't this a two-way battle? And in fact, such a scenario arises. The, the sources go on to say, the Mishnah goes on to say, that if the child is being born already, right, the language in some sources is torn itself away from the uterus. In other words, it's independent. Actually, the general agreement of the authority of the post is, what we mean by that is when the head's been delivered. Once the child's already being born, that means the head is already in the air of the world, or in a breech presentation, the lower half of the child has been delivered, up to and including the umbilicus. Okay? In either of those scenarios, we rule, that's called birth. At that point, the child, the mother's life does not take pre- precedence, but mother and child have equal claim to life. And then, says the Mishnah and the post keeps saying, that if, the, if the labor delivery becomes obstructed, then the question is, who's an aggressor on whom? Okay? Here you have this mother, she's giving birth, the labor's obstructed, the child's already considered born, but we cannot now advance because they're threatening each other. Okay? Here, the general ruling is we may not interfere. We can't kill one of them to save the other. And the reason is, if you don't have one roi on another, but two people each threatening the other, then you can't arbitrarily take sides and kill one of them. You can kill the other fellow. You don't have to say, well, it's like fair and even. Again, are you, are you, yeah? if A is trying to kill B and B is trying to kill A, you happen to be C, you can't kill either one in a case of mutual roi However, if A is trying to kill B and you happen to be B, okay, then you can legitimately kill him because he's ultimately killing you. If the mother and fetus threaten each other, we can't make the choice... Okay, about which one to kill. There's a lot of technical background here, but that's the, the, the bottom line ruling. And therefore, all else being evil, we have to wait and see which one in fact threatens the other, and that it's not a situation of mutual threat. What is... And, uh, I'll stop for questions in, in a while. What's <coughs> even more difficult here is, what happens if it's clear, not that either one's threatening the other, but that both will die if you do nothing? That's the next stage scenario. Not that one will die. If the child dies, then you can proceed to... Dis, yeah, to... to, to um, to um, dismember the, f- the body of the child and extract it in order to save the life of the mother. But what happens if neither one, neither one is, is dying, but they're both going to die if you do nothing? Okay? There it's a very difficult situation. There are some post who say the mother can kill the child. You may not be able to because you're a third party. Okay? But since her life is threatened by this child, she may be able to take action. I don't know if we actually rule that in practice, or if it's even feasible or possible, there are, there are, there's that line of thinking. So, here's a complicated issue. The Rambam here says that the reason you can't kill the child when it's already being born, is because that is the way of the world, says the Rambam. Min shamaya karad that's the expression. From heaven, this, there's, there's a, the pursuer here is not the child, the pursuer is heaven, as it were. And all the commentaries ask the same question. Why do you say that here, but when the child's inside the mother's body, then you don't say it's from, from heaven. And there must be at least ten different answers you try to resolve these two different situations. I'll just say one of them for simplicity's sake, and that is Rashi. Rashi says very classically, and if you want to take it further, you should look up Ramosha Feinstein. He also has a fascinating insight here. I don't mean to compare Feinstein with Rashi, of course, he was many centuries later, but um, he has a wonderful explanation here, putting together many of the, uh, the opinions. Rashi says the reason that the child inside the mother, okay, is considered to be a relative to the extent that you can terminate the child's life, says Rashi, is for two reasons. A, the child's a redef, they've been threatening the life of the mother, and B, it's not a full-fledged life. It's not a full-fledged life. A child that is still within his mother's body, that has not yet begun to be born, is not a full-fledged life. Now, there's a big debate in Rashi, why exactly not? Because you can break Shabbos to save a pregnancy, you can break Shabbat to save a one-day-old pregnancy. Right? Um, the child has inheritance rights, there's all sorts of proofs that the fetus, the unborn fetus, is a human being, there's no question about that. Okay? He wouldn't be allowed to break Shabbat if that were not the case. However, says Rashi, despite all that, while it's unborn, it's not in the same status as a person who's already born. One demonstration of that, 
Can you think of one? Can you demonstrate to me that an unborn child is less of a human being? Can you give me a measure of that? We've mentioned it this evening. It well, could die on its way out. It's along those lines. It's the consequence of that. And he that is... A what? If he can't survive without a mother. And if you That's can, good. If you've got a choice between one... Yeah. I think you've mentioned before, if you've got the choice between saving one life or another, and you know one might not survive the year... Right. You, you okay, that's nice, that's nice. I'll tell you what's ruled definitively here is that you, you may be correct, but there's a stage beyond what you're saying, and that is we know that the, the, the punishment for killing a human being is capital, and the punishment for killing a fetus is definitely not. So that's already a measure of the fact that the child is less, there's less actionable damage, as it were, in destroying the child, yeah? and therefore, whether you take that line of thinking or others, therefore the child unborn is... Um, is definitely not taking precedence, and that's why we choose to save the mother's life and not the child's, until the child is already being born. You know that Catholic law, incidentally, is exactly the opposite, if you know this. Catholic law holds that, the, if possible, the child's life takes precedence. Just mention this briefly. And the reason is, Catholic authorities have told me, that the reason they do that is because they feel that because of the doctrine of original sin in Christian thinking, the child is born in a state of sin, and if it can be saved until baptized, it will be guaranteed a place in the next world. Whereas the mother has already been baptized, and therefore it's less important to save her, because she's already guaranteed by the, by the founder of their religion, she's guaranteed a place in the next world. And therefore, if possible, they will choose, if possible, to save the child and neglect the life of the mother, yeah, again, because they believe that it's important to save the one who's not yet been baptized and saved. My father, al was a who ended his life in another medical specialty, but spent time training in obstetrics and gynecology, he was working in a Catholic, um, tr- trained in Dublin, in a Catholic um, maternity hospital, told me that there were times at, when he was attending a woman in labor, when the husband would walk over and say, Doctor, if my wife's labor becomes obstructed, I would like you to save the child and sacrifice my wife. Now, these were not cases of uh, difficult marriages. These were cases of um, the Catholic doctrine. Not that he ever had to do that, but that is, we rule exactly the opposite, that, in fact, the mother's life takes precedence, and if necessary, we'll um, t- take the life of the child. These are some of the parameters that, um, that apply. Now, in practice, of course, it gets much more detailed. What is, con- what is constituting a, a risk to the life of the mother? I see at least a couple of psychiatrists here. Is psychiatric risk to the mother considered risk to her life? That's an interesting question. The boys can agree that if she is clearly at psychiatric risk, that means she would kill herself, not just that she's threatening to manipulate, but in the best judgments of competent consultants, there's a real risk of suicide here, then according to Jewish law, of course, that would be um, a risk to life. A risk to sanity would also, that means not that she'd kill herself, but she'd become insane, psychotically ill, then that would also constitute a risk to life. There are many authorities who allow lesser risks to be brought into play in Jewish law, um, and that depends on, again, their attitude to what is the source of the prohibition. Just to be fair, I'll mention the most extreme opinion. There is an opinion in Jewish law that <coughs> there is an opinion, there's actually a widespread opinion, that abortion in Jewish, for Jews, is actually a rabbinic prohibition. Okay? A rabbinic prohibition. If that's true, then it's a much more lenient prohibition, and these authorities actually allow termination of pregnancy for much lesser indications than the one we discussed this evening. We try not to rule that way. There's very clear, it's a very clear minority that holds this, but this is a well-known authority. One of the most best known in this field is that it's Elias, a major authority in his own right. I think his present volumes of responsa run to about, I don't know, at least, at least 20 volumes of responsa, most of them on medical subjects. He was the head of the Israeli based in. He was the rabbi of Sharon Sedek Hospital for many years. I think he's now retired. <clears throat> but he is t- uh, well known to take a lenient view. He's the, probably the only modern authority who allows termination of a pregnancy when the child has been diagnosed as having Tay-Sachs disease. Okay? In fact, I once went to him. Actually, I once went to one of the other post of this generation with a young family, a young couple, who were diagnosed as having a trisomy 18, I think it was, Edwards syndrome, where the child would almost certainly not survive although it might be born alive, and the mother was extremely distressed, and she was absolutely insistent on terminating the pregnancy. Now, in Jewish law, that's problematic. That's very problematic. So I took them to a particular very well-known halachic authority for a ruling, and we sat down around his table, I'll never forget this, and the young husband put the situation to him, and he said, my wife's very insistent on on terminating this pregnancy, and um, what's Jewish law? And his words were, don't ask me, go and ask the tzitzeliezer. 
Okay? He's don't ask me. You're going to get the wrong answer from me. You want an answer from me? I'll give it to you. You're not going to be happy. Okay? You go ask him. Because he was well known, and he's a major authority, and he's well known. He, he rules that, in fact, not only that, he rules that not only his pregnancy uh, can be terminated in the first 40 days, which I'll try and explain with thinking behind that, and not only in the first three months, which some authorities talk about, <coughs> he rules that the pregnancy can even be terminated later. I think his cutoff is until movement is felt. Right? Until movement is felt, even then you can terminate a pregnancy in cases like um, Tay Sachs disease. Others all disagree. The most lenient opinion we have besides that is in the case of anencephaly, which means that the child could not survive independently at all. We're not talking about Tay Sachs where the child will be born, might live for a year, year or two or three or four, maybe something like that. There we would not allow termination of a pregnancy under normal circumstances. But in anencephaly, where the child couldn't live independently at all, okay then the major authorities would agree that you could in fact terminate the pregnancy um, earlier where there's no hope for the child to live at all. I was involved in a case not long ago where the child had a um, had polycystic disease of the kidneys and the kidneys were so enlarged that there was no lung function. The kidneys were so enlarged that the lungs hadn't developed at all. And it was quite clear that the child wouldn't be able to breathe at all. Okay, ex utero. And there, there was this line of thinking Right. Again, you need to be very clear about the details, very clear indeed, but <coughs> if there'd be no possibility of independent survival at all, then this could be given the mother's distress and so forth, there could be, <coughs> there could be room for this. But that would be a, a particularly lenient authority that we have, we have today. Just mention one more thing and I'll stop for questions. In the first 40 days of pregnancy, there's a different approach here, okay? and according to many authorities, even for non-Jews. And the reason is that the Talmud says that in, within the first 40, 40 days after conception, not the way we in conventional medicine measure pregnancy, okay? We measure pregnancies from the first day of the last menstrual period. That's the convention. The reason we do that, of course, is because it's much more easily counted than the actual moment of conception. In Jewish law, we time things from moment of conception, and that's why we time a pregnancy differently than the, um, the non-Jews, right? How long is a pregnancy in Jewish law? How many days? Who knows what the Hebrew word is for pregnancy? No? Herayon. What's the gematria of Herayon? The word Herayon in Hebrew, no? What's the gematria of Herayon, no? 271. Yes, the Gemara rules that a pregnancy is 270, 271, or 272 days. That's the normal duration of a human pregnancy, the same as the number arrived at by the word pregnancy, Herayon in Hebrew, from the moment of conception. So, for the first 40 days after that, the Talmud says, the child is considered unformed. The language in the Talmud is it's maya ba'alma, it means it's like only water, it's not fully formed as a, as a fetus. In fact, it's very interesting, a few years ago, a, a British gynecologist, a lady by the name of England, did a fascinating series of intrauterine, did you ever see these intrauterine photographs? She took a series of women who were about to terminate their pregnancies, and she photographed, she inserted a camera into the uterus and photographed the child from the very beginning, okay, all the way, an example of each, a photograph of each day of pregnancy. And it's fascinating to see on the 40th day of pregnancy, you can see the child is fully formed of fingers and all the, all the, all the details. Until then, the child's actually not formed. Interesting because as well, the Talmud says that at that stage, the child has about the diameter, about the thickness of your of a small finger. So this is very important in the menstrual laws, when the, how much is the opening of the uterus, when a child is, um, passes through the cervical canal, is there considered to be bleeding or not? These are very interesting things. In fact, that is exactly the width of a, uh, the dimension of a fetus at that stage. Very, very interesting. But the point is that um, until 40 days, there's a much more lenient approach here, because the Talmud says this does not yet have a human form. Now, don't make a mistake. It's not permitted. Abortion is not permitted at that stage, and it's still allowed to break Shabbat to save such a pregnancy, and all sorts of, all sorts of other conditions apply. But it is less of a prohibition at that stage. Okay? Not permitted, but less of a prohibition. We would accept lesser criteria for terminating a pregnancy that's less than 40 days old, and many authorities say it applies to non-Jews as well, because this is not a Jewish thing. It's just that the child isn't isn't yet formed, and therefore it has a different status. So there would be uh, possible, um, uh, possible leniency in those types of situations. And probably the most practical output of that situation is the type of situation like rape or incest, where there's a request for um, uh, RU486, one of these drugs that causes a very early termination of pregnancy. It's taken in the, very, uh, in the first 24, 48 hours of pregnancy, a potential pregnancy, there some authorities hold that it's allowed, not because it provi- produces an abortion, but because it prevents implantation. Prevention of implantation of the conceptus in the uterine wall is much less of a problem halakhically, 
okay, even though you could consider it to be an early abortion, but it's much less problematic. This applies to contraception with injury on devices as well, and that is why it's po- possible that that could be allowed in certain circumstances, particularly where there may be major consequences later. There are authorities who are much more lenient in those circumstances. Again, none of these things, don't walk away from here thinking that these things are allowed in a blanket sense, but these are the nuances. There are some who talk about three months, although most authorities say there's no reason to do that. I mentioned one who holds that when the child begins to move, it's a significant time. Basically, what all agree is that 40 days is a significant cutoff, and the next significant cutoff is when the child lives independently, okay? When it tears itself away from the uterine wall, when it begins to be born during labor, most, Rosh Hashanah says what that really means is when the head is delivered. Then you're talking about independent life, and then we have a different set of laws. Are there any questions about these basic parameters that we've raised that I can... Yes, please. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. That's, yeah. And the second one was implications for antenatal screening, things like that. All right. Okay. All right. <coughs> Your first question is the first question was <coughs> can you refer a woman for a termination of pregnancy or assessment for termination when you're not prepared to do it yourself? Pretty much practically, that's all you can do and have to do. Okay. Um, is it allowed in Jewish law? You see, in this situation, it's so inevitable, that's what she's going to do anyway. Yet you're not making this available to her where it would not be available anyway. Now, that doesn't always allow you to do things in Jewish law. In practice, that is basically what you do. You recuse yourself from the case. Okay, you say, look, this is against my religious principles. This applies to nurses assisting at terminations, okay, to interns assisting at a termination of a pregnancy. In Jewish law, you can't assist in a prohibition either. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein says you can't pass the matches to a smoker. You know that? You may not hand him the matches. Okay, to a smoker, right? Even though he doesn't rule absolutely that everybody has to stop smoking who smokes already, but it's clearly can't do that. You can't assist that determination. You can recuse yourself and tell her to go elsewhere, okay? That's not considered actively to be procuring that abortion. That is, that's the way to... Are you obliged to actually try to talk her out of it and persuade her not to? In the context where the non-Jewish law countenances it and... Um, and um, particularly where all she's going for is an assessment, right? The law does require certain parameters to be put into place in, in many cases, so that, that, that would be that. Your second question is um, screening. This is a fascinating question, very important. Basically, the approach is like this. The question here was, do we screen, for example, do we uh, do amniocentesis in the first, uh, first or early second trimester of pregnancy to see whether there's fetal abnormality? The Jewish approach is like this. We would, here's the general principle. We would certainly agree with all screening that's non-invasive, Okay, about which you can do something. For example, screening pregnant women for certain infections, whether it's um, venereal you know, disease, whether it's HIV, whatever it is. If there's something you can do about it, like HIV, for example, certainly, okay, there's no problem with doing that. Screening that have other benefits, for example, ultrasound screening, has major obstetric benefits. For example, simply dating the pregnancy, staging the pregnancy accurately, can have major obstetrical benefits, right? When you get to 36, 38 weeks and you're not sure if this is a small for dates, 38-week baby, or so, that can be of major obstetric importance, can actually be life-saving for the child. There's no reason that we would allow an ultrasound. There's not yet been demonstrated any downside or harm in ultrasonography, and therefore we would certainly allow that kind of screening. In fact, this Jewish standard would be you'd be obliged to. The reason is not just because it's beneficial, but the Jewish standard is anything that's accepted by the consensus of medical opinion, you're obliged to do, even if it's not objectively verified. What the world does around you, okay, according to the consensus of expert opinion, unless there's a reason not to in Jewish law, that's the standard. You're obliged to do that. And therefore, if they screen one ultrasound screening or two during pregnancy, two become standard, you'd be negligent as a Jewish doctor if you didn't do that. The problem is invasive testing, like chorionic villus sampling or like um, amniocentesis. There the problem is that in both of those techniques, there's a rate of fetal loss. In amniocentesis, the rate of fetal loss is somewhere between half a percent and one and a half percent, two, whatever it is, around one percent of pregnancies where amniocentesis is not pregnancy to be lost. So this is not an innocuous procedure. We would in no way do a procedure that is going to give the woman a one percent chance of losing that pregnancy without very good reason. CVS also similar similar type of figure depending in, in whose hands. So in Jewish law, it's like this. We would allow such a thing if there's something positive that can be done about it. Now, if you're going to do um, amniocentesis and discover that the woman has a type of fetal abnormality that Jewish law wouldn't allow her to abort for anyway, then w- what have you gained? Okay? Therefore, here's the general rule. 
we do not allow, okay, we seriously um, discourage women from having an amniocentesis as routine. The reason being, all you might do and is discover something <coughs> that you're not going to do anything about anyway. The practical reason, that's the halakhic reason, the practical reason is, in many cases amniocentesis, they discover a statistically increased risk. They'll tell the woman the normal chances of a problem are 1 in 200. In you, they're 1 in 100 or 1 in 80, and the woman starts getting very anxious, even though it's a very small percentage, but since it's much bigger than the norm, okay, then she starts getting extremely anxious. You've given her a serious worry in this pregnancy, and you're not going to be able to do anything about it anyway. Okay? Assuming you are. And therefore, the general pr- process is, we don't encourage, we discourage Anything that's invasive that might harm the pregnancy, where we're not going to act on the results anyway. Yeah. Right. Right. If you're having a, a, a nuchal thickness, you know, assessment, and you <coughs> using ultrasound, these sorts of things, <coughs> again, there's no reason really not to. There's no reason to. And from a kabbalistic and mystical and higher point of view, it's better not to. There, the kabbalistic reason is because when you know there's a problem. Okay, then you have to pray for a miracle. If you don't know there's a problem, you leave it up to him. There's a general principle that you know, something that's hidden from the eye, you can manipulate seriously. You can ask for all sorts of blessings, miracles, etc. He doesn't mind. No one's going to see anyway, so he can do it for you. But once you, once you expose it, and then you ask for a miracle, you have to be a much bigger person to merit miracles. So why expose this thing? If, you know, that, that's it. However, if there's a reason, for example, the woman is extremely anxious and you know she'll be calm by this and she'll have months of a pregnancy, calm r- rather than be tense, or there may be an obstetric benefit, okay? For example, maybe you know this child is a major abnormality, then although we might not actively terminate the pregnancy, we might be a little bit more lenient if she gets into trouble anyway because they are lenient to thought. It might make a difference to you. If you're not doing anything aggressive or invasive, it could be. That could be. That could be. The general Jewish attitude is, you do what's standard that's not invasive or negative, okay? You do anything that's beneficial, but beyond that, you trust up to, you know, many people will not see what the sex of the child is anyway beforehand, right? There's a certain sensitivity, but not, this is going to be a blessing either way, you know? So, you insist on painting the room pink, like you have to paint it pink before the child's born, not blue, you know? So, like, I mean, if you're really hung up on that, you know, you can do that. But. Yeah, are there any other questions that we, I mean, we just covered the, the, the yeah, please. This question is maybe uh, not valid from a halakhic standpoint, but it certainly rates high on the end of the uh, A certain country uh, may see its 30 year old position uh, on constitutional uh, uh, status of abortions reverse in the next four years. Mm-hmm. If that is the case, to okay. what extent is there an obligation to abort in a case where there is very clear danger to the mother? Right. And if it is an obligation, uh, what kind of position is the year actually lying in? That's a good question. The possibility of either transgressing it. Right, great. Or a very serious civil war. Right, very good question. Actually, you put the question very well because what Roe versus Wade established was that the existing anti abortion laws were unconstitutional at the time, and you're quite right, that would be the right terminology. The question here is what will happen if the law of the country forbids you to do an abortion and then you find it necessary, for example, the mother's life's at stake? The general principle is like this you are obliged to obey the law of the land, that means Jewish law. Not just the law of the land. Jewish law obliges you to obey the law of the land. That's called dinner, the malchut dinner. That means the law of the land obliges you, unless it contravenes a Torah law. Now, there's no more serious case of contravening a Torah law than a life and death matter. So the general principle would be like this. You'd be obliged to do what the country says, where it's neutral. For example, pay your taxes. Pay your taxes. Not speed. Jewishly, I hate to tell you this, but Jewishly you're actually obliged by those laws because the country obliges you and Jewish law obliges you to follow the law of the country where it's not contravening Jewish law. Where it does contravene halakha, then you are obliged to stand up for it and say, I'm not allowed to do this and you have to stand up for that and do it. If a mother's life were at stake and she'd be saved by this um, by this uh, termination of pregnancy and the country, I mean they wouldn't forbid, forbid that. I mean that's, that's another step, but assume such would be the case. Then Jewishly you would be required to do it. It is more weighty when you're going to be um, punished legally, when you're going to lose your license to practice. There are softer issues here, but the general principle is you have to do this. We often find ourselves in the situation medically, I've often been, myself been in that circumstance, where the law of the land asks me to do one thing, and Jewish law clearly says another. The reason that most, in most areas of conflict, in most areas of conflict, we get through it successfully, is because almost always we occupy the high moral ground. For example, when they say we're going to switch off a ventilator because the person's life's not worth saving, okay, and we say we'll do anything to save life, 
they recognize that there's a very moral position. They may disagree, and they may say, we look at it differently, and all you're doing is prolonging dying, etc., but they can't claim that we're being immoral in that, in that response. And therefore, we get to do what we want, because at present, in the most Western countries, all the Western countries I can think of, they do respect your personal conscience-driven or religious-driven issues, even though they may disagree with them, they respect them, and at least they will not force you to do that thing. They'll tell you to stand aside and get someone else to switch off the machine. Where it gets touchy is where they want you to switch off a machine, not because they're religious or moral, modern ethical view that you're prolonging the dying of a patient, but because they need the machine for somebody else who's salvageable. Then it gets a little bit difficult, or when other issues creep in. Last week, for example, I had a very difficult conversation with a consultant, intensive care consultant in a certain hospital here. Why? Because there's a woman in her unit who is on a ventilator, and this woman is, they think she's got a widespread carcinomatosis, and she's not going to live for very long they think, and hasn't been very firmly established because she's too sick for definitive investigations, but she's on a ventilator, and the consultants are wanting to switch off the machine as soon as possible because they're convinced she's dying. The dilemma was like this. I got involved, they asked me to speak to the consultants, I speak to the lady, and she says um, that they're going to do what the patient wants, because that's what British law says, patient autonomy, highest on the thing, whatever the patient wants. The children are religiously motivated, her children are religiously motivated, and they want everything done for their mother, at least until it's completely established that she's really terminal, that nothing can be done, etc. So, I try to explain to the consultant what Jewish law is, how we'll do anything we can, and under what circumstances we can stop treatment, and she said to me, you know, the children may feel that way, but the mother's not so religiously inclined, and the mother doesn't agree with her own children. The family want the mother to be treated, but I'm going to follow what the mother wants. Now, I... It was very hard for me to explain to her that in Judaism we don't do what the mother wants or what the children want. We do what God wants. You know, I, I was already two, I'm two steps away from that. You know, that, it was very awkward. I'd explained to her that this isn't the question. She thinks the tussle is, and the family having a very tough time because the the, do, the doctors are are threatening to do not what the family wants but what they think the mother wants. Now the mother can't really express herself. She's on a ventilator. Okay, she's a very sick lady. So the two consultants went to the mother without the family present and they leaned over and they said to her, Dear, if you become poorly, 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 would you want us to continue? And the lady kind of, she did something with her head. They're not exactly sure what. Now, the fa- you understand what's going on? The kids are, are horrified. They weren't even present to see. The mother doesn't understand exactly what the details are. But the consultant's clear that she has to do what she thinks the mother would want, not what the kids would want. These get very touchy in situations like this. Um, because from our perspective, of course, we could not allow somebody to die in circumstances where we're obliged to continue treating. We aren't always, of course, but this is not the not, not occasion for that discussion, although I think next week is, no? We're going to talk about euthanasia? A few weeks' time. A few weeks' time we talk about euthanasia. I'll try to delineate carefully the criteria for withholding therapy. Um, you know that on Wednesday there's a conference here in Britain, you know this? Conference on withholding at the Royal Society. Conference on withholding therapy. Okay, I think the Jewish view should be put forward over there for people in this country who deal with Jewish patients. They're going to talk about, and I think it deals with the Mental Health Act as well, whether, yeah, what's considered um, competence in, in terms of decisions about stopping therapy. So we'll have to talk about that ne- in mid session next time we meet, we talk about that issue. But the general principle is where you have to stand up for your principles, then even if it goes against the law of the land, you have to find a, a way to do that. Usually, usually we find a way to do it in a... Um, we try to do it in a dignified and, and uh, intelligent, uh, you know, can get difficult. Can I yeah. Um, just about the issue of, of an abortion when the child is not going to survive yeah. for more than a day or two or three yeah. minutes. I don't really understand why that's an issue at all. Because if that child's not going to survive, why does anybody need that guilt in their hands? Why does Which guilt? The guilt of doing what? Of, of when you go back to your three... Your three um, laws and looking at the, you know, the homicide and... You mean, why not just let it be born anyway? Yes. Oh, sure, no, why that's... Why did it even become an issue? Oh, I see, I see. The reason is because the mothers get very anxious and push for it. Again, Jewish law is very clear the best thing is to let the child be born. Yeah. Okay, in the le- with the least risk to the mother. Whether the cesarean is the least risk or whatever it is, we, we would certainly try to take that option. Okay? The problem is when the mother says she can't stand going through this pregnancy for months and she's also worried about the danger of a pregnancy, she'd rather have an early termination... A child's not going to live anyway. That's the problem. The problem is when you're faced with a family who say they just cannot live with the situation. That's our problem. Again, we don't urge abortion in that situation, but there are those who permit it if the child couldn't live at all, and carefully. The mother comes along and says, I cannot go through the next seven months knowing that I'm carrying a child that is that disfigured. 
And that's the situation. And she comes to ask that's for permission. That's emotional distress. That's yes. not a risk to the mother's life. No, though. no. So there are authorities, in fact, funnily enough, the majority here agree that if the child, you said a few minutes or a few days, there's a big difference there. Mm-hmm. Big difference. But if the child could only live for minutes or hours, this is no, hardly a brainstem, there's no, you know, complete handicap. In those situations, they have ruled that she, if she's distressed enough, then you don't have to force her to go through the rest of their pregnancy if she wants to terminate. I, 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 I'm not saying we should do that. I'm saying if she pushes for that. Yeah, are there any other? Yes, please. No, the question of contraception, I'm not going to go into now if you don't mind. There are circumstances in Jewish law where contraception can be applied. It's a whole different subject with all different parameters. It requires different background explanation. You have to go through all the methods of contraception. If you don't mind, I think we should do a separate... I'm not sure that's a subject for public talk. We can do that at some other... Okay. Um, you, there, are, there are some tense situations. Maybe I'll just finish with this. I mean, it can be, it can be very difficult. I was in a hospital here two years ago, one night, where a young fellow from this community had been very, very badly injured. In fact, he'd been diagnosed as having brain stem death. And there the debate was switching off a machine. And what happened was, <coughs> well, there was an intensive care unit. He was on a ventilator. Um, and I was present during the brain stem uh, testing, and he was clearly brainstem dead. It had been done a few hours apart. He was completely apneic. All the criteria were met. It was done properly. And um, there were a number of doctors and rabbis in the room, and the patient's wife. And um, the consultant walked in, and he said that this is the 24th of December. Okay? And he said, you Jews are immoral to keep my team here overnight for a dead patient. It's their religious holiday. Okay, it's 24th of December. They want to go into their families. We've got no one else in intensive care. I'm going to let them all go off unless we get a new admission, and this patient's dead, because he's brain dead, and our law in Britain says that brain death is dead, and you Jews are insisting on keeping this ventilator going, what was happening, he was on the ventilator, and he was getting presses, he was getting dopamine, etc., in ever-escalating doses to keep him going, and his blood pressure kept falling, but he was still, still alive, heart was still beating, and um, you're immoral to do that to my team. So we said, look, in Jewish law, he's not dead. I mean, we understand what you're saying, we all agree he's probably not going to live through the night, but that's what Jewish law says. He walked over to the mother, to the wife, and he said, Lady, your husband's dead. You know, and I'm switching off this machine. It was very unpleasant. Right? The qu- question wasn't needing the machine for somebody else. The question was like, you know, you're keeping us here for no purpose. What happened ultimately, was a very tense moment, the, con- the senior consultant, the ICU head, actually walked in and said, hey, they've got a right to their religious views. He said, you've got no right to impose your views on them. According to their religious teachings, the patient's not dead yet. He said, give him everything you can. And actually, four to six, about six hours later, there was just, you know, there was no response to the presses and the heart stopped and that's what happened. But it was difficult because under those circumstances in Jewish law, you actually, according to most opinions, you actually can't switch off that ventilator. So it does get difficult. But I think that he respected us for being firm and polite and clear about our religious, you know, obligations. And I think there was a bit of a feeling there that he comes from a system where they change the law as they go along and we come from an absolute position. And, you know, I think that although he disagreed very strongly, I think he respected that. Okay, next time we meet, Mr. Shem will talk about euthanasia and termination of, of therapy. Okay.